Well, hello. I have been looking around the internet for a description of something that I use as my favorite method for showing depth and dimension. Floating and floating shading and highlights. And while there are a few references to it, I haven't found anything that I thought was really useful for me. So I thought I would do this to show you how it can add so much depth to a particular work you're working on, and it's not very difficult. I come to painting from a decorative painting um, practice, and so I thought it would be useful perhaps to show you what I do. And this picture is something that we're going to practice on, or I'm going to practice on. You can do it on any picture that you have. But if you notice, these houses look very flat the way they are right now. And when I do some floated shading on these, you're going to see that they pop. An example of that would be this picture, in which the leaves are shaded and the flowers as well. And before I actually did it, it was a very flat picture. And once I did the shading on them, this floated shading, it popped up the flowers at you and it gives it a more three-dimensional effect. So that's what we're going to do with these houses. For floating, you would use a flat brush, if you like, or an angle brush, if you would rather. I prefer an angle brush and match the size of the brush to the area that you're doing. This is a relatively small piece of work, so we're going to use a relatively small brush. This one is a 3 8 Shiwi angular shader. This is one of my favorite brushes. I've had it for many, many years, and it still has a nice point, and it still works very well. Um, there's also a smaller, a one-quarter inch here, and so on, and smaller flats, but I'm going to use the angular shader. You need lots of fresh, clean water because you want your, your uh, brushes to stay clean, and of course you'll always need a piece of paper towel, kitchen paper as they say in England. This is my wet palette. Now I have uh, an actual wet palette commercial one, but I use this a lot. This is just the box from uh, Ferrero Rocher that I was given a couple of Christmases ago. And then it's just some paper towel and, uh, in this case, parchment paper over the top. And I always have a spray bottle with some water. In floating, what you're going to do is you are going to load your angle brush halfway, because what you want is a gradation of color. You can use any colors that you want, but it works well if you think about what shadows actually are. Shadow colors tend to be into the blues, the warm grays. You can use black, but black is such a harsh color that it isn't really what you see. If you look into a shadow, it's not really black, although we may call it black. It's generally some version of blue or purple sometimes even a brown. And the other thing you see in shadows is that the color around it might be reflected, so you may want to add a little touch of that color to it. So in this case, I'm going to start with my favorite color for shadows, which is Payne's Gray. And Payne's Gray is actually all the way over here on this palette. I'll turn it this way, perhaps it'll be easier to see it. And I, this is the palette that I used for painting this. I also have a little bit of water with some float in it, some uh, color float. As you can see, some of these bottles are relatively old. This is an old Ceramcoat color float. But you can also use a little bit of uh, Flow Aid. I use a Flow Aid from Liquitex. You add a little bit into the water in order to allow the surface tension to be broken so that it flows more easily. You can also use, to load your brush, some floating medium. This is a very old bottle, again, which is flo Folk Art Thickener, or floating medium is what it's called now. It's been called that since the days of Donna Dewberry and her, uh, her one-stroke painting. 
and that allows you to load the brush with something that will fill the bristles so that you don't have this tendency for the pigment that you're using to walk across the brush so much. So the first thing you do is dampen your brush, just moisten it in the water, and then take most of that water off in a paper towel. Now you can load your brush a little bit with floating medium on the heel. So this is the area that's going to be away from your shadow and load that, stroke it back and forth on the palette. And then you pick up the color you're going to shadow with. And in my case, this is a little bit of Payne's Gray. And then you stroke it back and forth on the palette. Now some people will stroke only on one side and then flip over and stroke this way on the other side. That's totally up to you, but I have a preference for doing it this way. And as you can see, the brush is starting to load that pigment across. So you stroke quite a number of times until you get what you want. Now you don't want an excessive glob on that end, so I'll often just touch away any, any thick piece of paint that I see there. And the other thing I'll do is if I think that there's pigment in this end, I'll give this a little pinch to take any extra pigment out of here. And then what you do is you float it where you want the shadow to be. So I'm going to start over here, I guess, with... Um, let's look at this house. Because it's behind, you want the impression of depth. So I'm going to turn this so that it's easier to see and easier for me to do. And what you do is you lay your darkest area at the point where you want the darkest shadow to be and then you just stroke gently. Because it's an angle brush you can also pull it to a point. And if you wish you can walk the color out a little bit. That means just to move outward towards the, the other area. And there you have your first shadow. You also have to think about where your light is coming from. In this case, the light will be coming from the left, so from this side, okay? And so our shadows will be darker and greater on this side and lesser on that side. So underneath the E, for example, the shadow on this side will be more marked and darker than it will be on the other side. And you can reload on your palette and then pull down along the other side here because you want the concept that the house is in front, this darker house, which is actually green but looks very black here now, is in front of the other house. So you would shade all the way in here and down. Now you can also shade along the snow here because of course the houses are in front of the snow and the snow will give you a better view. If you find you don't quite have enough, pick up a little bit more. Stroke back and forth. You can make these shadows as subtle as you like. higher because our light is going to come from that side and somewhat lesser on this side. You can turn the piece any which way you want because the light will come in more from the left hand side. And there we've shaded our first, here's my floating medium, we've shaded our first house. If you find it's not it's dragging a bit and not flowing the way you want. You can always add a little touch on the heel of floating medium or water. You can intensify that shade as many times as you wish. Now we'll do the same thing again, but underneath 
and back here, but narrower now. So tip the brush up a little bit so you don't have as much contact with your piece. So that you still get a shadow, but it's not as large. And there you are, you have the first one. So that's our first house. Let's go over here now to the, to the red house. If you want to pick up some reflection, you can always add a little bit of the color that you initially had on that toe as well. This is the toe of the brush versus the heel, so I'll pick up a little floating medium there. You'll see there's a little tiny bit of red there, and what that does is add in the color of the house so that you get that impression of it being reflected. Now again, remember your light's coming from this side, so shadows under the eave are going to be wider and thicker on this side. Now because we're talking about the sunlight coming from this side, we can also add a little bit of shadow around the windows and doors to give definition to the windows and doors and indicate the direction of light. So again, light's coming from this side, so this side over here will be in shadow and underneath. Don't pull it all the way. You'll see already your window starts to pop. Now there'll be a small shadow underneath this eave, as there are always shadows underneath an eave. If you find it's drying a bit, just go back in and reload. And as I say on this side, tip up a bit. I'll do the same thing here. Remember that the shadow from the front house will fall right across the window all the way up. And there will be a little bit of shadow from the house from behind here. This is a chimney. much water, but sometimes you just need a little bit in order to get them to flow. And again, light's coming this way, so on this side of this window there will be some darkness. The effect can be quite subtle or if you wish, you can make it markedly stronger. You can also use it to settle the trees down. I'm just going to clean this off. And if you want to settle the trees down, then you can take your Payne's Gray and add a little touch of green, the green that you used with the trees in order to give that a graying or darkening. A bit more. Floating medium on the heel. Light's coming this way, so shadows underneath the tree here will be on this side. And then if you want, you can use a flat to drag that out a little bit more to get an impression of shadow 
over towards this side. And if you feel it's a little dark, which I feel it is there, just stroke over away on your palette a little bit. And it'll pull it underneath. With a little bit of work and practice, you'll get the kinds of shadows you want. Remember that you can always pull this stuff out a little bit as well. With a little bit of water on a brush, you can wash it away again if you find it's too strong, as long as you get it right away. I'm using the toe of the brush to get into the crevices and then I'm walking that shadow out a little bit. It gets lighter as you get away. What it does is it grounds the tree so that it looks like it actually belongs. Okay, so we're already getting some definition there that we didn't have before. I wanted to show you that we can also pull up the snow a little bit more so that we can see the difference between the different mounds of snow. And snow tends to be a blue, so what I would do there is I would pick up floating meeting again on the back. I would pick up my Payne's Gray and start a nice little stripe of Payne's Gray. And then pick up the blue that I had used around here because the blue that's in among the, the uh, snow and in the background is actually an ultramarine type blue or a brilliant blue. And then you can add some more depth if you wish, to the snow. To pull out the, the shapes in the snow, if you wish. Shadows behind the various mounds. Floating medium to dampen your brush. Go back into your stripe. Dot off anything excess. We want to define a snow mound. Stand back a little bit and look at it and see what you want to add or subtract from. And again, you can already see depth coming into this. Now I'm going to do the same thing. Pull right in behind the snow on the houses. I'm going to use that same color because we're talking about the light that's reflecting from the snow.
And if you find you're getting a little dry, don't hesitate to give it a little spritz. And if you go over like I just did there, I always keep a flat brush. Or sometimes um, I have a very nice stiff filbert that I like to use for cleanup. So trying to be aware of you being able to see what I'm doing here. If you go over the top of the snow a little bit, it gives that indication of the mound going around. There is a roundness to it. Yeah, I'm getting a little low there, so there's a little bit of Payne's Gray. A tiny touch of blue. medium. There we go. Oh, I forgot my snow mounds in behind. Okay, touch of Payne's gray, touch of blue, stroke, 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 lots of strokes, clean off any excess on the end. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to shade all around all of these windows later, but so that you can see another aspect of this. If you look underneath here, of course, there would be some shade underneath the snow as well. So what we can do is we can take, again, our Payne's Gray, the piece that we were working on with the blue, we can leave that and use that and add a little bit of that gray that I used for the roof line. And so what that does is it gives you some of the coloring from the roof line and really what you're doing is you are shading that color that you used for the roof line. And that makes that connection. You're just mixing it using the brush. So you're using the same color but darkened. But you're not darkening it with black. Oh, I'm not. I'm darkening, darkening it with Payne's Gray. And so again, you would go in here and follow along underneath your underneath your snow just to darken that a little bit. And I'm tipping the brush up again so that I'm only getting a narrow float instead of the whole brush floating. And that gives me narrower shading because, of course, I don't have a whole lot of area to work with here and I don't want to pull that out onto 
the house particularly. I also want to do in here where the chimney is. And if I want it a little darker, like I do, you can add a little bit more Payne's Gray to that mix. Because this brush actually comes to a point, you can even use it like a round brush. Feel your brush grit getting dry, just pop back into the floating medium or into the water, but be very careful not to add too much water because you don't want it to run. I just find floating medium is easier to deal with because of that. You could also use a glazing medium. You have to be careful that glazing medium doesn't change the shininess because a lot of glazing mediums tend to be a semi-gloss or a gloss. And if you're working with matte paint, then it changes the coloring that you're working with. the other chimneys in a minute. want to do under the eaves over here so you'll see it a little bit more clearly. And I'm going to start with a clean section here. And that's just Payne's Gray and floating medium. More. Walk that out a little bit. Make sure that this end is not too wet. Light's coming from this side. This side is going to be darker.
ideally I wouldn't have put that icicle in already. And that's why I'm working around it a little bit here. And a little bit of a shadow here. You can make your shadows darker or lighter. You can always go over them again if you find that they're not strong enough. And light's coming this way, so around the windows. A little bit down from the top. I don't know if you find it's too strong, just pull it back a bit. And brush. is as I find it right there a little bit wide go in in the brush start again but you can come back into that same stripe that you have just only work slightly into it corner As you can see what that does is it gives your your windows some definition. Also I have to do that around the door obviously. You have to be consistent, you know. Alright, so that's shading. Now I'm going to go ahead and go into highlighting simply because I'm sure there are people who don't want to sit here and watch me shade everything on the on the uh, picture. And so I'm going to go into highlighting a little bit. And in terms of highlighting, you're doing exactly the same thing, but in reverse. So you're picking up either white paint or a lighter version of the color that you are working with in the particular case. And you're using that to highlight an area. So I actually did this, uh, did the windows in reverse because I wanted to show you that as a highlight. These windows, if the light is coming from here, okay, will be brighter on the right-hand side. The reflections will be lighter on the right-hand side. Now, there was another reason why I used the yellow ochre to base in my windows, and that is because the yellow ochre has a better uh, opacity, a better hiding quality. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use um, yellow, a light, a cadmium yellow light, and I'm going to do exactly the same process. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to highlight those windows. And again, you can do this with a flat brush. You can do it with a, you can do it with an angle brush. It doesn't work so well with a round brush. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to take this. And if you think about it, it's going to be wider. Your reflection is going to be wider on the top than it is on the bottom. Wait, now while I'm positioning, sorry. So I'm going to lighten that up this way. And just streak down the side like this. Do it again. The next one. And I'm going to go into that corner and then I'm going to pull that light down. Okay, and if you want to lighten that up even a little bit more, all you need to do is add a little bit of white to your to your yellow. And that gives you a little bit more brightness. Again, take that off the end there. And uh, this window here is very much in the front in this house, so let's, uh, let's make that one quite bright. Walk that out a little bit. It's a little dry, so if you want it a little smoother, just touch into your water or your mix too much water on the end, pull it off. And 
has a little bit more float to it. And that's a very bright window. I'm going to make this one the same way, maybe a little less bright. Pull up a little bit. edging. Oh, and you can also highlight your door. Again, this side of the door would probably be um, receiving the most light. Now, yellow makes a good highlight, so you can use yellow for it. Just pull that down on that side. And as I say, it gives you dimension. Now, these we haven't shaded the windows, but we can also shade them and then they'll be more plastic looking. So if I go back into my shadow color and again a little bit of floating medium. Just going to spray my palette here. Can you still see my palette? I hope so. Take this brush out of the way. color and then I go around these windows now obviously on this very dark color it's going to be less easy to see but you'd be surprised at how the effect actually works Also going to pick up a little bit of burnt umber. I'll come over here maybe. And a little bit of Payne's Gray. And I'll shade the inside of that door.
do a little highlight on the side of that blue house because again light's coming this way so you'll see some brightening on that blue over on that side so I'm going to take a little bit of a I'm hoping you can still see let me just check yeah I still seem to be in the frame I'm going to take a little bit of that blue and I'm going to take some white I'm going to tone that blue into a highlight. Put a medium on that side. I'm going to darken a little bit and just add a little bit more. And again, I'm going to make this take off before you leave. Now, light coming over from this side. It's a little dry. And if you're not sure, I always have paper so that I have a look at how that looks before I actually put it anywhere. Okay. So I say that on paper it won't move as well, but you'll know then how it looks. So here we go. Let's highlight this side. Because this is where the sun's going to hit. Remember that dimension is all about highlight and shadow, highlight and shadow, highlight and shadow. Now, because each one of these houses is a different color, the highlights would have to be individually mixed for each one. And things like the green, for example, will be... Um, let's just look at the green. Green. And add a little bit of white to it. It's a very narrow spot for highlighting in this in this case. Okay. Pinch away any pigment that you think might be on that side. I'm drawing on that heel. But I'm getting into my I have to be careful because I'm getting into my white over here. that off the clean damp brush want. or you can just paint right back over it with a little touch of white afterwards and if we, we can also if you like just use white to highlight but that depends on your preference. So I would do the same thing. I would pick up my white. Now with white, because it's quite strong, I would um, make sure it's well diluted on the brush so that you don't have a really powerful white stripe. And again, it depends on the effect that you're trying to get. So I'll come over here to this one, and I'll do the wash up here. So you can see the white highlight coming up the side. Now, a little bit more moisture.
And you have to be careful to be aware of where you have highlights and shadows happening. Right? So you don't want to have highlights going over shadows. Shadows go over highlights. And so there is the house. Now, again, this side of the door would also be highlighted. Now you could do this highlight with a little bit of the red in it to, to bring up the color, or you could just do this. Now, if you want to highlight your windows, which are already yellowish, but you want to bring them up a little bit more, again, same sort of thing, just to bring up a highlight on top of your highlight, so you can layer highlights. All right, so I'm going to go back to doing all my various highlights and shadows to finish off this piece, and you're welcome to watch, or that's basically the level of instruction up to now. If there are things that I'm going to add, I'll let you know, but um, I'm sure some of you are saying, okay, that's enough, I'm going to go off and just paint now, so please feel free to go ahead and do that. Because as I say, I'm just going to be shading and highlighting now. I'll tell you what I'm doing as I go. Right now I'm just going into Payne's Gray. I'm out of floating medium. So I'm going to add a little bit of floating medium. And take my Payne's Gray and just go through as need be. shading underneath this very dark green house. wondering what's in the background. I'm just listening to CBC Radio 2.
play with your shadows a little bit until you get them the way you like them. And these here are going to be almost invisible, but I do them anyway. By the way, I don't know if, you, if you've noticed, but I still have to do doorknobs on my on my doors. I'll just do those with a dot and then a shadow line underneath them. Just increasing my shadow on the on the side that would be most impacted by sunlight. suggest you play with this. Even go back on pieces that you've already done a while back and see how it modifies the picture. It gives it more definition. House with a cat. There's always hairs.
my brush and do the rest of my windows. I have two containers of water, one for the coarse cleaning and one for fine cleaning, shall we say. And highlights in windows are not all smooth and even. So it can be a little streaky. Too much in there because there's actually a shadow back there. Do want a little bit of light. And as you see, I'm going back over the ones in my blue house, and you can always repeat. Okay, it just dinged at me for some reason. I think we're still okay. And just do some highlights with white. And highlight the tops of these. The tops of these chimneys a little bit just to pop them. Go a little bit more into the white. 
point of the door. Remember that uh, that acrylics dry darker, which is one of the reasons why you might well come back and decide to enhance or re layer another layer of highlight over a previous layer. Getting the tops of the windows a little bit more. Now you can also, and I didn't mention this earlier, if you wish, go around the roof itself, around the snow, and pull it up from the background a little bit. I'll do it here at the side edge of this house, just so that you see what I'm talking about, because it can bring the structure forward from your building, and uh, from your background. And of course, remember that you'll have a cast shadow. Every building will have a cast shadow of some sort, and remember we said the sun was coming down from here, so the cast shadow will be on this side. So we can do that on the outside of this house. So there would be a shadow cast by that house. So we bring that forward from the background. You can actually do that around the top as well on this side, of course, because this is the side that the light is coming this way. So as you can see, that increases the level of dimension, and you can do that all the way through. Try not to go up over the top of the of the roof line. Because of course the light would be coming this way. So it should be angled a little bit. Always think about where your light's coming from. Remember, too, that you have artistic license, so if you want to pull up your house a little bit more, go for it. Looks good to you? Go for it. And then you look around and you look for what you haven't done, like over here I didn't put a cast shadow on this side of this house. So it won't pop from the from the background if I don't do that. But right up against the So go a little bit around the trees if you want. I already did the bottom of the trees. We can pull that in a little bit more. Oops, there went a the brush. Wherever 
wherever you want to add a little bit of depth of color, you can do that. Okay, I'm going to go off and uh, these windows have to have muntins put in and I'm going to play with it a little bit more. I promise that I will put a picture of the finished product in the description underneath so that you get to see what it actually looks like when it's all done. But this is certainly long enough and I'm sure that you will be tired of listening to me mumble on. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this. This is Monica from Bear Necessities signing off.